Welcome, everyone. We're very happy to have you here. And uh, we hope we have a fascinating program for you to hear. And we would like to encourage you all to join our society and be willing to join a committee and be an active part of supporting the history of Mamernik. So uh, our committees are Newsletter Committee, Burial Grounds Committee, which is appropriate for tonight, uh, Publicity and Events, Landmarks and Membership. So please give that some thought. And if you haven't um, really seriously considered joining the, the Historical Society, I hope you will. We have applications in the back. Um, we would like to thank the Women's Club so much for being such wonderful hosts for uh, our meetings. And it's been a delightful place to be. And will Ann Malibet please come up? The Mamarian Historical Society would like to present a certificate of appreciation, and, and I'll just read it. This is to certify that the Women's Club of Mamarian has earned the grateful appreciation and well wishes of the Mamarian Historical Society for the generous sharing of, of their clubhouse, May 8, 2017. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, also, I'd like to announce that um, the program that some of you may have heard uh, last fall that was given by John Pritz on the uh, history of Harbor Island was on LNC TV and is now uh, accessible online at lnctv.com uh, so, or .org. So uh, please remember that and tune in if you missed it. I'd also like to announce that uh, I believe since we have met uh, our esteemed board member John Pritz has since been named Mamaroneck Village Historian, taking over for his mother. <laughs> we appreciate all the many years that his wonderful mom, Gloria Pritz, uh, uh, exemplified in, as a historian and uh, did so much incredible organizing of Mamaroneck's history and he is taking over the uh, village archives and, and all. Um, all I have? Um, before I start, because a lot of people are often confused about uh, what is Mamaroneck, for the purposes of our talk tonight, when we talk about Mamaroneck, it's going to include all the town of Mamaroneck, unincorporated and incorporated Mamaroneck and incorporated Larchmont, plus the portion of the town of Rye that's in Mamaroneck Village. Um, so we're going to cover all that tonight. Um, Mamaroneck is kind of interesting compared to some other communities in the area in that it does not have a public colonial era burial ground. Even though that sign says that the town of Mamaroneck burial ground was founded in 1755, there's a little technicality there. Um, but there was no, which I'll get to later on, but there was no public place where people could be uh, interred regardless of their family, regardless of their uh, religious status. And so for the most part, the early burial grounds in Mamaroneck are family burial grounds. And uh, just across uh, Route 1 from us, going that way, is the Richbell Family Burial Ground, um, which was founded by the family of John Richbell, who of course purchased this area uh, from the Native Americans. Um, it is the oldest family burial ground in all of Westchester County. Um, so it has quite a bit of status there. Um, if you, has anyone ever been there to check it out? When you go there, you'll notice for the most part, there really aren't tombstones. There are just rocks in the ground. Um, sometimes you'll hear those rocks called Quaker tombstones, but they're actually not necessarily Quaker tombstones. They were often used by Quakers, so that's why they're sometimes called Quaker tombstones. They're actually field stones. Um, for the most part, the people in the area in the early 1700s and for the Rich Bell bur Burial Ground going back to the late 1600s would not have been able to obtain proper tombstones as we know them today or as we would know them during the uh, late 18th century. So for the most part, they would just take a nice pieces of rock and use them to mark the graves. And because they really didn't keep records of these family burial grounds, they would put two. One for, your head one for your head, which would be called your headstone, and one for where your feet were. That, that would be your footstone. And so hopefully those markers would stay in place. 
and no one would dig your grave 20 years later when they looked, went for another one. So when you go to the Rich Bell Burial Ground, for the most part, that's what you're going to find. You see all those rocks and things like that there. Those are all actually tombstones. Uh, further towards the back, you can see an appropriately carved tombstone, which is a piece of sandstone. And it's for a woman named Agnes Bain, who died in 1797, or two, I'm sorry. Um, this is really the only properly carved tombstone in the burial ground, and it's made out of sandstone. By the late, mid to late 1700s, sandstone became the preferred um, material of choice for tombstones in this area. Um, sandstones have pluses and minus about them. The plus is that the carving holds up pretty well. So if you look at it, you can actually see the inscription. The downside is that the sandstone can occasionally get water inside, and when the water freezes, it can cause the front to crack. So if you go to a place like the Old Dutch Churchyard in Sleepy Hollow, you'll see a lot of sandstones like this, but the face has all fallen off. So fortunately, that hasn't happened for this one. Um, the Rich Bell Burial Ground was used until about the turn of the 19th century, and it was kind of forgotten and overgrown for many, many, many years until the early 1960s during the Mamarnik Tricentennial when a nice monument was installed there. Um, and it gives a little bit of the history of uh, how John Rich Bell purchased the, um, the area where we are now. Um, in, there actually is a, uh, a record in the Mamarnik Town records going back to the early 1700s. Uh, John Rich Bell's son-in-law, James Mott, allowed the Disbrow family to bury there as well. So there are some members of the Disbrow family that are buried there too. And in that particular record, James Mott mentions that that's where John Richbell is buried, as well as John Richbell's mother-in-law and James Mott's wife. So we know for certain that John Richbell is in that little burial ground. Um, most of the burial grounds in Mamaroneck are still intact, but an exception is the Nelson family burial grounds. Um, a man named Polycarpus Nelson owned property bordered by present-day Fenimore Road, Maple Avenue, the Sheldrake River, and the Boston Post Road. And at some point, he had a burial ground located on the opposite side of Fenimore Road from where we are now. And he had a little tombstone cut for himself. The tombstone is no longer Mamaronic. It's not even in Westchester County anymore. It is in Rhinebeck in Dutchess County. And that's it in the sort of right foreground. You see there's two hands with a heart. So Mr. Nelson's tombstone went on sort of an odd, an odyssey. Um, in the 1840s, it was taken out of the burial ground across the street, and it was moved up to a Nelson family plot in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery up in Sleepy Hollow. Later on, Nelson family arranged for a newer monument to be put in their plot up in Sleepy Hollow. And so the company that made the monument really liked that tombstone and they took it. And they had it in their sort of display area. You know, you see those uh, tombstone companies, they always have some tombstone displays. So they had it sitting there because they thought it was very interesting. Later on, someone, and uh, we're kind of lucky that they did this, took it from there and put it in the Rhinebeck Cemetery. And so even though Polycarpus's remains are probably underground somewhere across Fenimore Road from us, his tombstone is all the way up in Rhinebeck. Um, and so he died in uh, the 1730s. And what's interesting is that it's really hard to see, but right below the hands, it says that he died at 4 o'clock in the morning part of the day. Kind of strange. It was dark. Uh, one burial ground that's connected with the pretty important historic event in Mamaroneck is actually just a block or so up from us. Um, on October 22nd, 1776, there was the battle or the skirmish or the engagement here at Heathcote Hill um, between a, uh, a loyalist force under Colonel Rogers and an American force. And, um, the men on both sides who died were buried just north of us here on Run Row between Heathcote and Delancey Avenues. Um, both sides, those were Americans. Uh, they weren't British soldiers on the, the British side. Those were loyalists. And so they were buried in an area there. They're 
a grave site was sort of forgotten about until some water mains and uh, gas lines were being put in in the early 20th century and their remains were uncovered and they were known to be soldiers because there were things like buttons, um, uh, sort of military artifacts. And uh, according to the people that did the work there, they buried them right on the site. Um, so strangely enough, what you're looking at is actually a military burial place. If you're going up Rockland Avenue, you've probably seen this weird terrace. Um, this is the Disbrow family burial grounds. Uh, I mentioned before that the Richbell Cemetery was used by the Disbrows, but at some point they decided to establish their own burial grounds. And there's sort of nothing like this in Westchester with those, the terrace from the street and those nice little steps going up. Um, if you get up there, there are a fair number of uh, field stones around. So even though the oldest tombstone is 1811, my guess is with those um, field stones, it's probably a little older than that. It may go back into the uh, 1700s. Uh, part of the cemetery is used by the Disbrow family, but at one point, a member of the Disbrow family deeded a portion of the burial ground to the Merritt family. So technically, if, if you want to get really technical, you can call it the Disbrow Merritt burial ground. Um, when you're up there, you see the foreground is the portion that was deeded to the Merits, and the area in the back, that was the Disbrow burial ground. And so on the left, that's a man named Edward Merritt, that's his tombstone there. And on the right is a man named David Disbrow, who was a soldier in the Civil War. And um, let me get that out of there. Um, and so he died of uh, disease in Washington, D.C. As you probably know, more soldiers died during the Civil War of disease rather than battle wounds um, and, uh, or were killed in action. Um, so he died in Washington, D.C., and his remains were sent back here to Mamaroneck for burial. Um, and as I mentioned before, on the left, that's Edward Merritt's tombstone. By the time that Edward Merritt died in the 1830s, marble had really replaced sandstone as the preferred... Uh, um, material of choice for tombstones. Um, marble was nice because you could carve it, and we'll see some marble carvings later on. The downside is, for the most part, it hasn't held up very well to the elements. The inscriptions on these tombstones are actually pretty good for marble. If you see some earlier ones, you just uh, uh, you might be able to make out the person's name, but that's about it. And there's Edward Merritt again. If you're going up um, Mamaroneck Avenue towards White Plains, right before you go under the New York State, uh, I'm sorry, the New England Thruway, wrong side of the county, um, you'll see on the right there's a burial ground that's sort of surrounded by the exit ramp or the entrance ramp. And that burial ground was founded by the family of Eliezer Gedney. Um, he was a native of uh, Boston who came to Mamaroneck, and he died in 1722. Um, he's the oldest, or the first known burial in this cemetery, but again, with all the field stones there, it's possible that there are actually uh, previous interments that were made there. Um, in 1793, the Gedney sold off their, um, the farm on which the cemetery was located to the Lawrence family, and there was a stipulation in the deed that told the owners they could not sow or grow grain in the burial ground. Kind of strange. So you're going back to these uh, sandstones here. If you look at the left side, that's for a man named John Townsend, who died in 1771. So that's a pre-Revolutionary War tombstone. It's also it's tough to see because it wasn't so good to take a picture of it. Above the words "In Memory of of those are crossed uh, bones." You see the cross bones up there. You can just sort of see the bottom half. It's tough to see the top. <clears throat> Um, on the right side, that's his footstone. Usually, footstones just have the deceased's initials there. Um, but that says I Townsend, the I being a J. And it actually says where he was born and uh, the year of his birth. That's kind of really unusual. Usually, all that information is just on the headstone, and the footstone just has initials. Um, there are some kind of strange. Uh, 
um, symbols on the tombstones there. This is for a John Gedney who died in 1770, 1766, I'm sorry. You see the skull and bones up there? Do you see the circle there? Right. That's a snake eating itself. Very strange symbolism, but it's supposed to show kind of the circle of um, the circle of life. Um, and if you get, it's tough to see with this shot, so I did a second one. So the top of the snake eating itself, which you can see, there's the snake's head. The top says, time how short. You see there's an F for the S in short. And it says beneath that, eternity how long. Uh, the epitaph at the bottom says, death is ye curse produced by sin. Through Christ's eternal life we win. And you can see the carver didn't space his words right. So the words, it says by and then sin. And it says eternal life. And then down here in little letters, we win. <laughs> um, this is a tombstone with a pretty uh, elaborate epitaph. Usually you don't see these really long romantic epitaphs come into use until the Victorian era. Um, but this here is from 1811, and I'll read it because I think it's kind of interesting. Stop, reader, whoever the passeth this stone, nor regardless be told, that near its base lies deposited the remains of Mary Dixon, wife of John Dixon, a woman whose reputation was spotless <laughs> and whose life was spent in the practice of virtue, having by her unshaken fortitude, having by her unshaken fortitude and native independence of soul, commanded the esteem of all who knew her. She departed this life August 12th, 1811, aged 33 years. Oh, <laughs> um, so these are good examples of what happens to marble. On the left, that's Eliza Gedney's tombstone. You see the hand pointing up in the air? Right. I haven't across, come across any pointing down yet. <laughs> uh, the one on the right is a child's tombstone. Um, you see in the middle there's a lamb. Um, lambs did not necessarily have a Christian connotation, although they could have. Lambs are usually on children's tombstones, kind of a symbol of innocence. Um, oftentimes in the Victorian era, children's tombstones, you will see there's a nickname there. So it says, like, Little Robbie L. I remember seeing a tombstone for a girl named uh, Louisa, and it said, Our Wheezy. So um, you can see they had a, a even, even though uh, child mortality rates were much higher than they are now, um, they were just as affected by the death and the loss of their children, and they really expressed that through their tombstones. Mm -hmm. um, the one on the left, it's kind of, again, you can see the wear and tear that is uh, the toll that's been taken on the marble. That's a, a girl kneeling in prayer. You see her hands up in the air. Um, on the right is for a five-year-old girl named Paulina Gedney, and if you look at the symbol up there, you see an angel carrying a child off into heaven. Um, that symbol you might see on a, an adult's tombstone as well, but instead of the, the angel carrying the child, the angel is kind of leading the adult. So there are two adult figures, and the angel is kind of showing them the way to heaven. So this looks at the Lawrence portion of the burial grounds. Um, in 1856, the Gennies and the Lawrences got together and said, um, because the Lawrence had, has, had founded their own portion of the cemetery next to the Gennie portion, they decided to merge it as one piece. Um, and part of the stipulation with that was that the Lawrences were not allowed to use the Gennie portion of the cemetery, but if they wanted to take and carry away any fruits from the trees in the Gennie burial ground, they could do that. Kind of a weird stipulation. <laughs> there were actually two tombstones in the area of uh, the New England Thruway and the Maranick Avenue. So the left, that street that says 100, that's the Maranick Avenue. You see the Gedney Cemetery there. Mm -hmm. Now where it says AV upside down, that's Barry Avenue when it used to go through. Right. And if you look at the E on AVE, look just up you'll see a little box that says C-E-M upside down. You see that? Right there. 
So that was a much smaller cemetery that belonged to the um, Haddon family, and it was used from about 1760 to 1860. Um, by the early 20th century, it was um, largely abandoned, a lot of damage to it, and uh, unfortunately, unlike the Getty Cemetery, it did not survive the construction of the throughway. Um, the remains were taken up. This is sort of a grainy newspaper photo of the work. If you look at the left side, you see the, um, the coffins there that they're going to fill up. Um, I was, my research says that they were moved to Greenwood Union Cemetery in uh, Rye. I'm not particularly sure where they are, but um, there is an area where some graves were moved from in Meredith, um, as we'll see in just a bit. Another branch of the Gedney family had a cemetery in um, the portion of Mamanic that is now in Rye. And uh, that's the branch of the Solomon Gedney family. Um, that's the Bellow School in the back. Um, and so we're sort of looking from Barry Avenue past the cemetery towards the school, if that makes sense. Um, it was founded at least as early as 1817, but again, there are field stones there, so who knows, it may even be older than that. Um, there's a line about Saul McGedney that one of his children said, and she said, I have seen father, mother, 12 children, and an uncle sit around the table at one time. So that must have been a long dinner table. And she also added that all 12 children were temperate people. <laughs> so um, there were some later burials there, and it's sort of in a strange spot. Has, if you've ever been there, you have to go through someone's driveway to right. get to it. Mm -hmm. right. Um, so, uh, and unfortunately, over the years, many of the tombstones have been toppled, as you can kind of see in the back. So you see there's some field stones there right near the playground, so those could be even earlier graves. Um, this is a piece of tombstone lying next to the stone wall, and uh, you'll see on a lot of Victorian era marble tombstones, they'll have weeping willows, very common to find on these tombstones. You might also see like a, 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 a monument. So maybe they couldn't afford a fancy monument like the one the woman is leaning on, uh, but they could at least have it inscribed on their tombstone. And then occasionally you'll see depictions of a woman, and as far as I can tell, it's always a woman. I've never really seen a man. A woman in mourning dress. So you see she's kind of leaning on the, um, uh, the monument. She's kind of in a, a mourning dress and a mourning pose. Um, there were some later burials made there. If you see the monument in the center, the big one, uh, that's granite. And so in the late 1800s, granite replaced marble as the tombstone of choice. And for the most part, it's still being used today. Um, if you look directly above the granite monument, that is the Getty House being demolished. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, it oh, was, yeah. it was oh, leveled, yeah. Um, the monument on the right is for two uh, siblings, two brothers that died on the same day, June 19th, 1910. Um, Alfred, who was 12, and William, who was 10. Um, I haven't looked at the newspaper to find out what happened to them. I wonder if there was some kind of accident. The bottom line says, always together in life and death. Um, did anyone go to Mimarek High School? Do you recognize this cemetery? Yeah. <laughs> so this is the, um, the Florence Powell Family Burial Ground, and it's located between the Mamaroneck High School property on the, the, I guess it would be the North Driveway or the mm -hmm. uh, East Driveway, yeah. um, and uh, Fulton. And the stones there date from 1808 to 1883. The the family owned a lot of the land between Rockland Avenue and Mamaroneck High School. Um, we have a report that was done by a Mamaroneck High School student in 1940, and he talks about the cemeteries in the town, and he mentions that this was already in pretty bad shape, that a lot of the stones had been vandalized. Um, if you go there, though, the two tombstones that seem to stick out to everyone are those two right there, those two older sandstones. So you can see on the left, there are the headstones. On the right, those are the footstones. 
So this is the tombstone of Peter Florence. Um, it's a little tough to see. I put one in color, I put one in black and white, but they're still a little strange. You can see this sort of a fancy border around it. Uh, Mr. Florence died in 1808 at the age of 57. And his epitaph says, my glasses run, my days are spent. My life is gone, it was but lent. And as I am now, so you must be, therefore prepare to follow me. <laughs> Sweet. Pretty obvious. So that's the, that's the epitaph right there. Kind of tough to see. But, uh, you, a lot of times you'll see a variation on, of that on late 18th, early 19th century um, sandstone. So the Delancey burial ground is right back of us here on, um, on Palmer. And uh, people often ask, where is Caleb Heathcote buried? Where are the original Heathcotes buried? Um, from what I've read, they were buried beneath uh, Trinity Church in Manhattan, down by Wall Street. Um, and I believe if, if you were to go there today, though, you can't find the entrance to their vault because the church burned during the Revolution. When they rebuilt it, the foundations of the church were extended. Um, so he and his family are down there somewhere beneath the church, precisely where I'm not sure. Um, but they weren't, they weren't buried around here. Um, so his grandson, John Peter Delancey, was a loyalist who served the British. But he came back to the United States in 1789. And he built the house, which used to stand out back and now stands a little bit over that way. Um, and he established the burial ground on his own property. Now, we're looking from Palmer towards the burial ground. You probably passed it and seen it. But our, my best guess, I was talking to some members before, is that the burial ground, all the tombstones faced away from Palmer. Because if you were here in the house and you walked back to the burial ground, it would make sense that all those tombstones would be facing you as you walked up to it. Um, James Fenmore Cooper's daughter, Susan, who I guess would be John Peter's granddaughter, mentioned that at one point there was a stone wall around it. And you can see some pieces of a stone wall sort of scattered around the, the burial ground. So that's John Peter Delancey's tombstone. Again, you can see the marble is pretty, um, it's been pretty beat up over the years. Uh, but it does mention he was born in the city of New York. And at the bottom it says died at Mamaronic. The word Mamaronic is right where the piece of the wall sticks out. So the right, that's John Peter Delancey's footstone. That's what most footstones look like. And you can see the pieces of, uh-oh, there we go. So you can see, my guess is we're, we would be looking about where the stone wall would have been on the Palmer Road side. You can see some pieces of rock and stone there. If you look down from the balcony of the house that you can see in the picture, mm -hmm. you can see where the stone wall went. There's enough rock still there to see where it mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're actually there, it's tough to see in photos, but you can more or less tell where it was. So the above shot was taken in 1907. The shot below was taken in 2007. So you see all the tombstones are still standing up. Um, the last three burials there were of John Peter's son, William Heathcote Delancey, who died in 1865. Uh, his wife, Frances, who died in 1869, and their son, Edward, who died in 1905. Um, John, uh, William Heathcote Delancey was an Episcopal bishop. He was the first Episcopal bishop of Western New York. And the diocese up there decided that they wanted his remains in their church. So in, right before this photo was taken, their remain, the remains of the three uh, Delanceys were moved up to Geneva, New York. Um, and supposedly as late as the 1950s, you could see the open tomb of Bishop Delancey, even though of course he wasn't in it. Um, so you can see the changes that have happened over the year. All the, the tombstones up there are standing up straight. Down below, of course, not so much. Has anyone ever been to the Guyan burial ground? Okay, probably not. As, it's a tough one to get to. Um, so the Guyans are, or Guyans, I guess, in French. Uh, they were a French Huguenot family. 
They were originally buried in the Huguenot burial ground in New Rochelle, which was taken out for the New England Thruway like the Haddon Cemetery. Um, but one descendant who moved up to Rye decided to establish his own burial ground on his property. Um, the oldest uh, tombstone there is from 1808, so it's not a colonial era cemetery as, as far as we know. Um, what's interesting about it is it has a vault in the back. Um, you see it on the right side there. That's pretty rare for a family burial ground in Westchester. Yes? What's the post road in Marshall? No. Oh, that's, that's another one we're going to get to. Oh, where is this one? Oh, I guess I should have said that to start with. This is um, between Stewart Avenue. So those houses up there are on Stewart Avenue, right off of South Barry, Barry Avenue. Yeah, it's, it's from the, the Continental View parking area. Yes, if you were to go to the car Continental View parking area, and there's water back there, if you were to go along the retaining wall for um, a couple hundred feet, you would come in right at this end of the burial ground. That's Guyon Creek. Guyon Creek, that's right. Guyon Creek, Dock. Yes, so this is also in Rye Town. Um, I seem to remember from my childhood going into the cemetery with a friend who lived at Nine Pan Stewart, mm -hmm. and we did see uh, stones from the 1600s. Yeah, it's possible there? that there were still earlier stones, um, but there's a second burial ground up the hill, which which is even older. Uh, it might be the one you're referring to, which we'll okay. get into in just a bit. Um, I, so this I'm not so sure about if that would have gone back that early, but the, the one up the hill, which I'll, like I said, I'll get to in, in just a bit, that could be that early. Um, but having that, that vault is pretty unique. Most Westchester family burial grounds don't have a vault. Um, if you get closer to it, oh, there's Guyon Creek in the back. It's tough to see, but it's sort of like a swamp land. Um, and some of those tombstones are pretty close to the shore. So the top shows a better view of the vault. And then above the entrance to the vault is that inscription, the family of T.F. Guyon, 1855. That sort of obelisk on the right is actually a cenotaph. Uh, cenotaph comes from a, word that, a Greek word that means empty tomb. So it's a monument or a tombstone for someone who is not actually buried there. It's for some members of the Guyon family that died in Europe um, in the 1800s and were buried there instead of New York. But they wanted to memorialize them in some way, so they put that monument there. Now, earlier when we looked at the, that photo of the town of Mamanic Barrel Ground, it says 1755. Um, the, the town of Mamanic Burial Ground actually originated as the Bud Family Burial Ground, B-U-D-D. Um, it was founded probably about 1754 or so, and it was used by the Budd family until 1813. Um, if you go, if you walk into the cemetery and you go towards the back left-hand corner, that's the Budd family burial ground. But by the 1820s, Mamaronek was getting so big that they really needed their own uh, public cemetery, a town cemetery. And so they spoke to the Buds, and the Buds allowed for a sort of L-shaped portion around their square burial ground to go to the town. Um, so they acquired that piece in 1829. Uh, and so, for I, I think into the early um, 20th century, it was used by uh, the town as a public burial place. But the year 1755, 1755 doesn't mean that that's when the public burial started, that's when the Bud family burial ground started. And of course, now there's a big um, apartment building in the back that's since been constructed back there. Kind of a strange thing to look out on, but. Yeah. Quiet. Quiet, quiet, good neighbors, right? Where is that located? Uh, that is on Mount Pleasant Avenue, just south of Mamaronek Avenue, on the right side of the road as you come under the train tracks. If you look on the right, it's right there. Um, this church is at the corner of um, Prospect and Mount Pleasant. Um, it was originally built as the Mamaronek Methodist Church. And on the west side of the left side of the building, it actually had its own churchyard where some people were buried. Uh, the burials were made between 1830 and 1861, but when the church decided to sell the property, they had to get the bodies out of there. And so they bought a plot in Greenwood Union Cemetery in Rye, and that's where they moved them to. So it's tough to see, but if you look in the grass, do you see it looks like there's a lot of stones down there? Those are all the tombstones from that cemetery, and they've all been laid flat. 
Um, unfortunately, that's a problem because the elements take a toll on the tombstones, but there are times when you go there that you can actually make the inscriptions out pretty well. Um, and so they were moved there about 1900 or so. Um, I mentioned before that there was a burial ground up the hill from the Guyon Cemetery. Right. That's this one here. Um, unfortunately, there are no tombstones left, but this definitely goes back to uh, colonial times. Um, it was founded by the Griffin family. The earliest known burial is 1752. So it's quite possible that there were some field stones and things like that that went even, um, even further back. Uh, the patriarch, so to speak, of the family was a man named Edward Griffin, and he was an interpreter between John Richbell and the Native Americans. Um, it's, this cemetery is often known as the Rogers Cemetery because of Dr. David Rogers, who was a pr uh, very prominent physician in the area. And he was one of the founders of the Medical Society of New York. Um, it was mentioned by a man named John Griffin in his 1797 will. In 1913, there were 10 inscribed <coughs> stones in that area, um, but unfortunately by 1943 they were all gone. Now it's still protected as a cemetery, so to speak. Um, no one can build on it, but unless you actually knew the history of it, you wouldn't know that anyone is buried there. Um, and what's strange is there was a right of way set up from Stewart Avenue back to the cemetery. That right of way is now used by people as a driveway. Um, but the cemetery itself is untouched. So that area where you see the trees right there, uh, there's an unknown number of people that are still interred there. I believe since that photo was taken that uh, some scouts from Rye mm -hmm. built a split rail fence around that area. Oh really? Because this was taken probably 2007 or 8, so it's quite possible it looks different now. I'd have to check it out. So now we'll go to Larchmont. Um, you've probably seen this cemetery on Route 1 just past uh, Larchmont Avenue. And it's actually two cemeteries. The one in the foreground is a family cemetery. The one in the background at top left is a Quaker cemetery. And both parcels were donated by the Palmer family. And the Palmers gave the far cemetery to the Society of Friends, the Quakers and they kept the cemeteries in the foreground as a family cemetery for themselves. Um, unfortunately, there's been quite a bit of vandalism in the, uh, the, the Palmer family cemetery. So you can see those toppled tombstones. From that, you can sort of see how they were built. You see the base, mm -hmm. and then the, the top part was stuck into it. So unfortunately, as time goes on, and the, uh, the glue, so to speak, that holds the two pieces together uh, is worn away, it's easier for people to topple them and knock them down. If you go to the Quaker Cemetery, though, that's what you see. A lot of really small, uh, low-level tombstones. And if you ever get close to them and you read them, there's not much information there. For many years, the Quakers did not allow inscribed tombstones to be used because it was thought that they were kind of vain. Um, and instead, they might use the field stones, like you see at bottom right. So that's why field stones are often called Quaker stones, even though that's not necessarily the case. Um, eventually, the Quakers sort of relented and said that you could use, you could have inscribed um, tombstones, provided that it just had the person's name, maybe a relationship to a spouse or a parent, if it was a child, uh, the date of birth, the date of death. So you see those names, those tombstones there, nothing fancy. No fancy inscriptions, no fancy um, symbols, nothing like that. So you see this one here is a good example. Hannah, daughter of Thomas T. and Miriam Griffin, so there's family relationship. Um, died 12th month, 19th day, 1848, age five years, nine months, 17 days. If you look at the day she died, though, you see it says 12th month in December. Does anyone know why that is? From the early Quaker tombstones, you're not going to find the months named. You're only going to see the numbers. And that's because the uh, names of months that we use, they're pagan in origin. And so if you look at Quaker records, which are very useful for genealogy, they'll always, early on, they'll always say, uh, the number instead of the name for the month. 
So maybe these people weren't as orthodox because they used the number, the, the name October there. Um, and it says, died March 27, 1845. In many cases, and my guess is this is probably the case with this tombstone, the Quakers went back later on and put markers there because um, it took a while for them to adapt to the use of these inscribed tombstones. So it's possible by the time this tombstone was installed, the prohibition against the, uh, the names of months was sort of eased or lifted. Now this is the vault that you mentioned before. This is in the uh, Palmer Burial Grounds. Um, it's also called the Palmer Barker Burial Ground because of a family connection. Um, the vault was built by a man named uh, James Donaldson, and he married into the Barker family. Um, portions of the Quaker Cemetery, as well as this cemetery, were, were lost in 1931 when Boston Post Road was widened. And so some of the remains were reinterred in the, in the same cemetery, but they had to be taken from their original grave. So this is a little family burial ground off of Cooper Lane, off of Weaver Street. Um, has anyone ever been there? It's a little tough to find because it's sort of in a strange spot. Right, St. John and Paul, right? Yes, right behind St. John and Paul. Um, but actually, when I studied it, even though the burial ground isn't that much bigger than the room we're in now, it actually sort of evolved from several different families. So at bottom right, do you see the field stones there? Mm -hmm. That's the oldest portion that was founded by the Haight family, H-A-I-G-H-T and the Bloomer family, and it was also used by the Mott family. Um, later on, the Palmer family bought uh, land next to it, and they established their own burial ground. So I think in the book I call it the Palmer, Bloomer, and Height family burial ground. So you can sort of follow it through the years because you start with those field stones, and then as time goes on, they start to use marble. Patrick? Mm-hmm. Would that Bloomers be the uh, Bloomers from America? Yes. Mm-hmm. More, a more recent shot, you see the, uh, the field stones in the foreground, the uh, Palmer tombstones in the back. Um, there was a very strange court case about this burial ground because the Palmers decided to give the part on the left side to one of their sons and the portion in the back to one of their daughters. And so to get to, for the daughter to get to her portion of the burial ground, she had to cross over the brother's land. They had a spat, and I'm not sure why, and the brother would not let the daughter bury, I think, one of her sons in her spot. She wouldn't let her cross over his little piece of burial ground. The, court, the case made its way to the New York State Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in New York State, and they ruled in favor of the sister. So she was allowed to go across the brother's plot and bury in her plot. Um, but they must have really not liked each other if they, they fought each other that much over such a silly issue. Again, a lot of tombstones here have been toppled. Um, a lot of times, sometimes it's vandalism, but sometimes it's just trees. The tree falls and uh, the ground. A lot of times these tombstones were not put up with foundations. And so the ground isn't so good. Things shift, things settle, and the thing can fall back. But you're looking in the foreground, that's the brother's plot, and then the back is the sister's plot. And again, you see the granite there. The one on the right that says Palmer, that's granite. And so that came into use in the late 1800s. And for the most part, we still use that today. You can still see the um, plot markers down there. Do you see this sort of like a um, kind of a column at left, a little column there, and there are iron bars sticking out of them? Um, it's kind of strange that these iron bars are still there, even though they've fallen out, because in many cases, the iron bars were taken during World War II for scrap metal drives. They were also taken out in some cases because the bars made it too difficult to mow. Um, so finding, you, you may go to a place like say, the Hollow Cemetery, they still have the columns there, but the iron bars are long gone. Um, so it's kind of strange that in this family plot, those bars are still there. And so that wraps it up. So if anyone has any questions, comments, concerns, criticisms, and whatnot, I'd be happy to take them. Yes. Sure. Um, Rye approached uh, Mike and I, or 
mm -hmm. to uh, try to get a grant to restore some of the cemeteries you were talking about, the Rye, mm -hmm. Rye Pam. What kind of suggestion do you have for bringing some of this back? Right? If you think like in the Valancey Cemetery, mm -hmm. worthwhile building a wall. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what way would you go about taking care of the cemetery? Um, I guess first I mentioned what the, the, the town law is. Um, and that New York State law basically says the municipalities for these abandoned cemeteries, and most of the cemeteries in the Marin count as abandoned cemeteries. Um, the town basically has to mow it a certain number of times a year, and they have to blow the leaves out, and that's about it. Um, the town is not required to fix fallen tombstones or rebuild stone walls and things like that. Um, there are two active uh, friends groups in Westchester County. One is in Bedford and one is in Ossony. And uh, they have put together a committee to work on fixing these um, issues. Um, and so I'll pass their contact information along to you because uh, particularly the Bedford one has been in existence now uh, for about five years and um, they sort of started off on a, a, a rough foot um, but over time they grew and grew and grew and um, they were able to get good relationships with uh, tombstone conservators, um, people that were able to fix up the stone walls um, and that sort of thing. So um, I'll pass their contact information along to you guys. Yes. It seems um, to me that someone should be doing a project to call, um, document who is buried in these uh, mm -hmm. graves. And there's a, pl a website called Find a Grave. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, has anybody done anything like that with these cemeteries? We know a lot about the names of the people buried in here because in the early 20th century, and around the time of World War I, uh, several genealogists visited these family plots and recorded what they found. So for example, that's the only way we know who, the names of some of the people who were buried in the, the Rogers Cemetery, where there are no tombstones left. Um, a lot of people on their own initiative have been uh, doing work for Find a Grave, um, taking pictures of the tombstones and recording them. Um, and it's pretty much been on people's own initiative. They haven't necessarily been pushed into it or or has them been part of a concerted effort. Right. Okay. Yes? Um, this is in Alabama, but you mentioned Greenwood Cemetery. You know, I understand there were slaves uh, buried there. Do you know anything about that? Yes. Um, when Greenwood Cemetery was founded, it was originally an Episcopal cemetery uh, right on the, the street. Is it Locust, I think? North. No, not Locust. North. 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 So that belonged to Christ Episcopal Church. Um, the deed for the cemetery stated, and this was about 1840 or so, um, that African Americans were not allowed to be buried there. A neighboring white family did not like that, and so they established a cemetery right near it, next to what is now the New England Thruway. And um, it was for African Americans who lived in the town of Rye, which at the time was the town of Rye plus the city of Rye. Um, that cemetery was founded right about the beginning of the Civil War, and it was used up until about 1960 or so. Uh, there were no people who died in slavery who were buried there, but there were people who were former slaves who were buried there. Uh, there are a number of uh, veterans, particularly from the Civil War, but also from later conflicts up through World War I. Um, the cemetery kind of fell into disrepair in the 60s and 1960s and 70s. Um, but recently, a man named uh, David Thomas, who is the Porchester Village clerk, has led a, a really great effort to fix it up. Um, there's a historical display there um, that, uh, that explains the uh, history of the burial ground, some of the people that are interred there. Um, so it's in the back of Greenwood Cemetery. If you go into the entrance near uh, the throughway, you just keep following it around, you'll see the entrance to it. Um, it was always kind of in limbo because it's owned by the town of Rye, but it's in the city of Rye, and there was a back and forth over who actually has control of it. Um, but that's more or less been settled, and a lot of work has been done there. Yes? Two questions. First is, are there any Native American burial grounds in Westchester? Uh, there are a number, but unfortunately not much has been done in terms of cataloging them. Uh, there was a sort of inventory of Native American places in the county that was done very early in the 20th century. 
Um, some of these places have unfortunately since been um, basically developed. Some of them are still out in the woods in places like Pound Ridge Reservation. Um, probably the most documented Native American burial ground was up by Croton Point. Um, but unfortunately not that much work has been done on Native American burial grounds. The other question is, what do we know about the funeral rites going back into the 16, 17, 1800s, and the funeral homes. I mean, obviously we had Papes and O'Neills and mm -hmm. there were predecessors to that. Do we know anything about the funeral rites? A lot of times pe wealthy people were waked in their own parlors. Right. Um, has anyone been to watching Nerman's house, Sunnyside in, um, mm -hmm. in Tarrytown? His, that's where he was waked in his parlor there. And people often say that the reason there were these big entrances in the parlor know whether this is a legend or not, was that they had to get the coffins in and out. And you had to go through the, the window. Um, I, ha I hate to say that I haven't done that much research on that kind of thing, um, but there are plenty of um, newspaper articles and these little obituaries and death notices from, let's say, around the time of the Civil War. Some of them, they'll say that uh, friends are invited to be attended at the funeral at a church. Then sometimes they'll say the funeral will be from the person's house. So maybe they would meet in the parlor. So it's sort of like the way you might meet in the funeral home before going to the church today. Um, the minister might come and do, say a few words, and then you go off to the burial ground. Um, interestingly, there's a, 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 a will for a man named Dr. Gilbert Budd, who's buried in the, the Budd family burial ground in the Mamaroneck Town Cemetery. And he was a British, uh, I forget if he was an army or navy surgeon, before the revolution. So he didn't fight against the Americans here, but when he was done with his service, he came back to Mamaroneck. And in his will, which I'm guessing was written about 1800, um, he talks about um, not having a minister say any words at his burial. He uses the phrase bungling journeymen. <laughs> and then he says um, something about that he wants to give everyone who carried his coffin um, a dollar, but he, he doesn't want any big service at the grave, which kind of makes me believe if, if he was so adamant about that and made sure to note it in his will, maybe there were big services at the grave. So, But again, I haven't done as much research on that as I should. Yes, sir. Um, you, you mentioned my family's interred in Greenwood, mm -hmm. and that goes back into the 1800s. Mm -hmm. But I, I just really, my question is, how many of the African-Americans who were indentured or who were of slaves, because it's, it's documented in our town records, mm -hmm. being part of the families, the disbrows, the homes, mm -hmm. everybody. Um, when the African-Americans passed away, where were they? That's a good question. Um, to the 1852, because our family passed away. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, the people in the South Shore area may have been interred at a place called the Carpenter Cemetery. I don't know if you've ever heard of that in New Rochelle. It's on, um, not Wilmot Road, the name escapes me. I want to say it's Sutton Road, um, near the Iona Prep School. Mm -hmm. And it was founded by a Quaker man named Joseph Carpenter, and he deeded it to several municipalities in the area. I think the Maranek may have been one of them, but I'm not completely sure. And um, he's buried there as well as uh, several members of his family. And he's used until the early 1900s. Unfortunately, there are no inscribed tombstones there. He was a Quaker and he wanted everyone to use, you know, simple, simple tombstones. Um, for Rye City, which of course at the time was Rye Town, uh, there is mention of two burial grounds uh, for enslaved people up towards uh, where Christ Episcopal churches in that area there. They called it, I think, the town field, which makes me believe that it may have been more like a village green and part of it may have been set aside for burials. Um, unfortunately, just not that much research has been done. And um, Are you familiar with the Grand Colan? I'm sorry? Are you familiar with the Grand Colan? I don't think so. C-O-L-A-N-T-H-U-B. It, it was a, a society for the African Americans to bring together monies that people couldn't afford mm -hmm. buried. And um, I, I just know that, that through that private underground of mm -hmm. monies, mm -hmm. it, it provided the burial. But that was passed 
from 1850 to 50s. Mm -hmm. My question was prior to that. Yeah, I, I mean, unfortunately, in this area, not enough research has been done on that for colonial times. Um, I wonder when you see some of those uh, field stones if they are burials of, of people who were enslaved. Because I know in Harrison and Purchase, there's a burial ground on SUNY Purchase campus that belongs to the uh, Thomas family. And right outside of it, even though there are no stones left, people who have done ground penetrating radar realize uh, that there are burials there. And they generally assume that they were burials of slaves. So it's possible that areas right outside of the family of burial grounds had these places, um, and but that tombstones were not necessarily used, and so the graves weren't marked. Um, unfortunately, that's an area that just it for prior to the eight, uh, 19th century, uh, not much research has been done for this area at least. Yes. Did you mention about in Grove Avenue uh, heading towards uh, West Street? Oh, that one. Uh, the reason it's not in there because that's in Harrison. Oh, uh, it's right across the border from the Marion. Uh, but that's that's for a, a, a man named Lion Miller and his family, and I believe he was in the militia before the revolution, but he was considered like a suspect loyalist. Um, but uh, there's a little sign there that says Miller and Friends Cemetery, but it's technically in Harrison. Okay. I guess I stuck to the borders a bit too much. <laughs> yes? The small family cemetery is where Grove and West Street come together there, right? By the That's family. it. Mm -hmm. That's David, David Haynes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the family. That's mm -hmm. the family. He, his house was on the Boston Post Road. Mm -hmm. The and street? Uh, he owned all the property right back. That was, that was the end of his property. The house was in the cemetery. Right the street that you see that dead ends right next to it, yeah. that used to be West Street before the, the throughway came through and they re it. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much for coming out. Okay, thank you, Patrick. That was amazing, amazing presentation. Hello? Okay, okay so anyway, um, we do want to award you also a certificate of appreciation, um, same as the other one, <laughs> uh, certify that Patrick Rafferty has earned the grateful appreciation well wishes of the Moranic Historical Society for his presentation of historical cemeteries of America. So we do thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Great. I just, just quickly would like to uh, um, say that we, um, want to form, and we are forming a committee for burial grounds, we can't possibly take everything out at one time. There's an awful lot, as you can see from what you just heard. We would like to start with one cemetery, which is the Delancey, <coughs> which has to do with our local Delancey family, and uh, the house is still standing, so we'd like to concentrate on that. A lot of work has to be done. Uh, could be very costly, very time consuming. Um, and we do need, we need to basically find the boundaries of the sand. We don't know the exact boundaries of it, where it starts, where it ends, how far back it goes, how far toward Palmer it comes out. Um, we want to find out about the stone wall. I think that's important. So we'll have to do some probing. We have to do some uh, uh, ground penetrating radar is another way. There's just so many things that we do have to do and look into. So right now we're right in the, the nowhere stage. So we'd like to start it up and uh, hopefully some of you will join up and join the committee and um, we'll see what we can do. It's a long involved process as Patrick could tell you and um, we'll do the best we can. So if you want to sign up and back and I think that's it for today. Thank you Patrick. Thank you.